33rd meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, may I remind everyone in the public gallery to turn off any electrical devices that may make a noise or interfere with proceedings. Uh, we've received apologies from committee members Gordon MacDonald and Gillian Martin. Item 1 is a decision by the committee to take items 4 and 5 in private. Are we agreed to do yes. so? Thank you. Um, today we have the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, Keith Brown, uh, to give evidence to us, and good morning and welcome to you. And also with him are Chris Stark, Director <coughs> on Energy and Climate Change, Mary McAllen, De Director for Economic Development, and Hugh McAloon, Deputy Director, Fair Work and Skills. So welcome to all of you. Um, before we commence the evidence session, there are two uh, matters to deal with. First of all, the committee would like to express its appreciation to the various chambers of commerce who uh, submitted evidence to the committee. And second, I think there may be a declaration of interest from one of the members. Thank you very much, Could I declare an interest as the Honorary Vice President of Energy Action Scotland? Thank you. And if there are no further preliminary matters, I'll invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to give evidence on uh, what I believe are an exciting range of measures within my portfolio's budget. Um, the measures themselves are designed to help address one of the most challenging economic scenarios in recent memory. As Derek Mackay made clear last week, the fundamentals, we believe, of the Scottish economy remain strong. In 2017, our economy continued to grow, and over the past year, the number of people in work reached a record high. Uh, Derek Mackay also noted the conclusions of the first Scottish Fiscal Commission report predicting continued growth and rising employment. However, we do also, as a government, acknowledge the challenges, not least the consequences of course, of the UK government's austerity policies. I would mention in particular the refusal to lift the pay cap, which of course has knock-on consequences for the Scottish government and its budget, the UK government's failure to control inflation, and of course the damaging uncertainty caused by Brexit. Take, taking action to counter these issues was at the heart of the Scottish government's budget announced on Thursday and is also at the heart of the decisions made within this portfolio. So for that reason, I'm delighted that the budget delivers an increase of £270 million. That's a 64% increase. I think it's the largest increase of any portfolio, uh, and that's the increase in the economy, jobs and fair work portfolio. I would, though, convener, acknowledge and apologise for the error in the draft budget chapter on this percentage. I think it mentioned 39% in the draft uh, chapter. It's actually 64%. The additional funding contributes to investment of almost £2.4 billion in enterprise and skills through our enterprise agencies and our further and higher education bodies. The Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board is now fully established. That support will be vital to the realisation of the four strategic priorities identified in Scotland's economic strategy – innovation, investment, internationalisation and inclusive growth, allowing us to grow Scotland's economy and to ensure it remains resilient. Convener, I know you're uh, all aware of the, uh, Scotland's long history of innovation and invention, and the government is focused on maintaining that proud record of achievement. And that's why the budget contains a 70% uplift in our funding for business research and investment, taking our investment in the coming year from £22 million to £37 million. And last week, the First Minister announced a new centre of excellence in manufacturing, the National Manufacturing Institute, to be based at Inchinnan. Construction will begin next year and is supported by £18 million of funding from this portfolio in 2018-19. Our programme for government also acknowledged our ambition to maintain our competitive advantage in the low-carbon economy and announced a commitment to a £60 million low-carbon innovation fund. And that commitment is supported by £10 million of government capital funding in this budget. A further measure set out in our programme for government was the creation of a Scottish National Investment Bank to provide long-term patient capital to support innovation and drive productivity growth. That ambition is now supported by a commitment to an initial £340 million capitalisation between 2019 and 21. However, while the bank is being established, we will create a dedicated Building Scotland Fund worth £150 million over the next three financial years. 
Uh, this portfolio provides £70 million pounds in 2018-19 with the purpose of supporting innovation in house building, helping to deliver modern low-carbon industrial and commercial facilities and to provide further support for capital investment in research and development. Uh, these measures will complement existing activity to unlock investment for ambitious SMEs, including expanding the SME holding fund by £25 million. Pounds. I am also delighted that we will now more than double our commitment to driving regional economic growth through our city region deals to £122 million. Pounds. Of course, this takes into account likely uh, future city deals for Stirling and Clubmanager and for the Tay cities, as well as looking forward to the um, Ayrshire growth deal and the Borderlands deal. But our focus is not just on domestic opportunity. The budget retains funding to support the actions set out in our trade and investment strategy. Our presence in Brussels is long established. Plans for a new Paris hub are developing and a new Berlin hub will begin operating in early 2018. London and Dublin innovation investment hubs are now up and running. With the process to double the number of people working for SDI in Europe well underway and with five local export partnerships established, the government has taken practical steps to maintain Scotland's long-held position as a trading nation. So, convener, this budget maintains the seriousness with which we approach the task of creating more inclusive growth and fairer employment. Inclusion in regional, regional terms by meeting our commitment to the south of Scotland, for example, with an initial £10 million to support the establishment of the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency and interim measures. But also inclusion through continuing our vital work on tackling barriers to work, supporting training and promoting fairer work, actions that are essential to improving Scotland's economy and improving opportunities for all. £17.6 million will support our devolved employment service, Fair Start Scotland, which from April 2018 will provide tailored, person-centred support to a minimum of 38,000 people who are furthest removed from the labour market and for whom work is a realistic prospect. Our overriding aim is employment services that work differently and more effectively for people to help them find work and to stay in work for services that treat people with respect and encourage people to take up the opportunity for finding work on a voluntary basis rather than being driven by the threat of benefit sanctions. Uh, Convener, the portfolio's 2018-19 budget and its 64% rise reflects our determination to grow Scotland's economy, to seize the opportunities before us, to build a fairer Scotland and to put the progressive values of this government into action. And I'm happy to try and answer the, the committee's questions. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, may I just start by asking about the enterprise agencies? And I, I think the Scottish Enterprise Resource Budget is due to see a slight real terms reduction over the coming year, and Highlands and Islands Enterprise a slight increase. Um, are you able to enlighten us on the reasoning or thinking behind that? I, th I think in my statement, Convener, I mentioned the £10 million that would go to the south of Scotland um, Economic Partnership. That was capital. But in addition to that, there's also £3 million, which essentially would, if you like, come out of SE's budget because SE has responsibility for that area. So that £3 million should perhaps be added to the figure for Scottish uh, Enterprise. Uh, the total draft budget allocation, including non-cash for Scottish Enterprise, is £256.15 million. That's up... 24.6%, and of course that include, that's non-cash, not just resource, uh, whereas the total draft budget allocation for high is an increase of 4.6%, that's, uh, sorry, 4.6 million, which is 7%, so a much larger increase in the total budget allocation for Scottish Enterprise than there is for high. Um, the goal that we're trying to uh, aim for is to withstand the economic shocks and sustain higher employment. And SE has continued to be fair to them to bear down on operating costs and also have made the offer to absorb some costs and live within, in terms of its resource budget, a flat cash um, a settlement. But as I say, that doesn't uh, include what's going into the south of Scotland and also a very, very substantial increase in both capital and financial transactions. That's the difference between the two, I think. Thank you. And John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. <coughs> um, yes, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned just now uh, financial transactions, and I think, frankly, there is a little bit of misunderstanding or lack of understanding around that whole sector as to what financial transactions are uh, what we can use them for, what we can't use them for. If, I, if I'm understanding correctly, they are linked to housing expenditure in England, but we are not required to use them for housing. And I also think 
we can't use them in the public sector, it has to be outside the public sector. But I just wonder if you could kind of explain around that, how you see that going forward and what we can do. I think you've given two of the uh, defining characteristics for it. So when I mentioned the money that's been put aside for the Building Scotland Fund, that includes uh, housing, uh, both pro public and private, um, uh, or sorry, affordable housing and private housing. Um, and it is the case that, uh, first of all, these have to be paid back. I think that's important to remember. Um, but yes, we do uh, apply them in those ways. It can also be used, um, and I'm happy to be corrected, for uh, things which are very central to Scottish enterprises function in terms of helping companies, uh, sometimes through loans, um, uh, uh, to help them get through particular or, it, or to expand. So we have a very substantial increase in FTs, and that, as I say, helps support both Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish Investment Bank. Uh, SMEs demand, I was just saying, for loans and equity. Um, it can be a very important way to try and help grow the economy and to protect jobs that are already there. So they require that access to finance, and I'm sure it will become evident through this evidence session that there's quite a number of ways in which the Scottish Government can do that and a number of different bodies that can help with that. But financial transactions give us, um, if you like, another, another weapon in the armoury to make sure that we can do that. They can be used for a number of different functions, uh, and they do have to be paid back, and you're right to say that we can't use them for the public sector. So, um, I mean, are, as you say, there's quite a substantial increase here. Do you think there's actually going to be the demand and the, to actually use the full amount? Yes, I think there is. I think part of that will rest upon us making sure that people are aware of it as an option. Um, uh, companies are aware of it. Um, it can help support other initiatives which we're already engaged with. Uh, for example, if you look at, um, I'm not sure if you were at the Scottish Microfinance um, event that we had recently, um, that featured a number of new companies formed due to the access to the finance that had become available through that. That was largely European funding. Uh, and once we'd made that, um, or helped to make companies aware of that possibility, and we've still got more work to do, we had 128 new and existing businesses received £1.7 million. Pound. That helped create 200 jobs. I think that was a case of a new fund letting people know that the option was there. That was relatively small sums, so up to £20,000 for startup companies that couldn't find access to finance elsewhere. So I think there is an issue about us making sure that people are aware of it, and this uh, session helps with that. Um, and also, it would be uh, true to say that it can help with the um, starting uh, up of the National Investment Bank, which I mentioned already, as well as the growth scheme and the equity and loans to businesses. So, yes, I think the demand will be there. It's up to us to make sure that it's used properly and that people are aware of um, that facility that we have. Thanks. And, and finally, I think, I mean, how do we handle risk around that? Because presumably we have to repay the full amount to Westminster no matter what. So if we put money into a company that failed, how is that handled? Well, there is risk attached to it. I think I've heard from, and the committee may well have also heard from a number of um, individuals involved within the economic development sphere who will tell you that being involved in economic development, if you're not involved and willing to take a risk, there's not much point in that activity very often. So there's no question there is risk involved. So we do diligence on these things before we make the commitment to it. And we don't seek to, to make a loss, but we also recognise that um, it is possible that a loss arises. There's not an economic development agency worth its name that hasn't made a loss on, on one or other of its investments or, or when they're backing a company. So risk is there, but we try and minimise that by the diligence that we undertake. Thank you very much. Um, a brief follow-up on that from Tom Arthur. Thank you, Secretary. Um, I was struck um, regarding the use of FT and the challenge, uh, challenges and the take-up. Now, the Financial Times uh, reported yesterday, um, uh, with the uncertainty over Brexit, companies have been holding off investment. I think it makes a specific, it gives a specific example of, in the third quarter, there was a decrease of 11.8 per cent um, in the same period in the previous year in investment in things such as vans and other transport equipment. Is there any way in which the financial transaction money can be marketed in such a way to businesses to mitigate the um, effects of Brexit in the sense that they're not being put off investing. Is there any way it can be targeted in such a way as to give them the confidence to invest? I think it's difficult to do that. I mean, I think there's no question that uh, you're right, there's been deferred investment taking place for quite a number of months now. But I think the financial transactions that we're involved in will often be uh, to try and enter the market where nobody else is providing that finance or not providing at that rate. 
uh, or where there's no risk appetite from the financial sector to undertake that. So I think we're usually talking about a different set of circumstances. It may be possible, yes, for a company that thinks that maybe it's not a safe bet to undertake investment just now because of the uncertainties of Brexit, for them to work with us on some financial transactions. But I think, by and large, this is for areas where we know that there are... For example, um, I mentioned the, the microfinance, so up to £28,000, where they can't access. In fact, one of the qualifications for that is you have to have been refused uh, by uh, a bank um, or financial institution for the, the borrowing that we you then ask um, the microfinance fund for. But at a higher level, um, we will tend to be talking to companies that have tried to raise finance but have found it uh, prohibitive or they're unable to get finance from elsewhere. But it is possible, of course, it is that we are... Um, we can find ourselves in a position of helping finance something where somebody's deferred investment because of the uncertainties of Brexit, or perhaps the uncertainties of Brexit have then made the finance too prohibitive for them to take on. And of course, we're advertising the, the growth scheme, the Scottish growth scheme as well, which is another means by which we can achieve that. Around £19 million has gone out the door already in relation to that. So it's, I suppose it's for different purposes, but there may be some crossover. Thank you. Um, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Um, just a couple of follow-up questions on the, on the National Investment Bank. How much of the funding for the bank and the Building uh, Scotland uh, Fund, how much will that uh, funding, how much will come from financial transactions money? It, the vast bulk of it, so £150 million I mentioned already to help boost house building, commercial property investment and support business R&D and also going forward into future years we expect consequentials from financial transactions to be a large part of the, the, the money that we raise for that. Thank, thank you. And you mentioned the growth scheme and Scottish Enterprise. Can you um, describe what role the National Investment Bank will have that is different from the existing enterprise support available through Scottish Enterprise, um, Highlands and Islands and, and other agencies? It, well, I suppose the first thing to say is it's not finally uh, defined as yet. So Benny Higgins, who I'm meeting with again tomorrow, uh, should come back to us in January with his proposals. That will give us more definition around the nature of the bank. But I think you'll find it's, first of all, um, in terms of its scale, so the £350 million that's been mentioned as initial capitalisation, also the range of its activities, and that will include potentially long-term patient capital, which can help companies uh, to scale up or to um, su provide support to a particular sector within the um, strategies that we have for uh, industry and enterprise. Uh, so it's mainly around the purposes, and also it's quite possible that we can uh, work other schemes. So you mentioned the growth scheme, whether that can be part of what the uh, National Development Bank does, and uh, one or two other schemes possibly could come into that as well. But as I say, it's not yet defined. We should be able to uh, have more clarity on that in January, and we expect to start the bank up, um, at least with the appointment of a chair and a board as a shadow board in the course of 2018. So we'll get more definition of it uh, very shortly. Yep. Thank, thank you very much. You mentioned the growth scheme. Um, I think uh, you also mentioned that money has started to be paid out of the growth scheme. Could you give us some details of uh, how much has been paid out and how many businesses have received financial assistance under the growth scheme? Yeah, we have, I think I've mentioned the fact it's about £19 million so far. That's been dispersed so far to 18 different companies. Um, we can't highlight the individual ones, obviously, for commercially confidential reasons. These are agreements with investors, but so far £19 million, and there are others in the pipeline as well. Thank you. Just moving on to um, the economy, and how this budget might uh, address some of the challenges you, you, you mentioned. The Fiscal Commission announced last week uh, the five-year forecast showing uh, growth over the next five years to be under 1%, 1 and the gap with the rest of the UK continuing. Uh, Fraser Valander have referred to this as, as unprecedented. Did you think we're facing a growth crisis in Scotland? I think there is a, a challenging growth environment for the whole of the UK. In fact, there's evidence from various commentators out today to support that. The UK also um, is facing a lower than trend growth over coming years. And for essentially the same reasons, people cite, of course, uh, Brexit, the uncertainties uh, which that has brought. But I think also uh, I mentioned the continued austerity policies of the UK government. And it's my view that we don't discuss nearly enough the impact of the UK government on the Scottish economy. So if you have a major clampdown on welfare benefits, these are commonly referred to, I think, by economists as transfer payments. That has an effect in terms of the money in the economy. So you'll have seen reports from the um, Scottish um, Retail Consortium. They're a big concern 
is always about the amount of money in people's pockets. Uh, now, if you substantially cut back on um, through universal credit on these kind of transfers, then you're going to impact that as well. I think it's also true to say, and I'm perfectly happy to concede the point, that if you increase tax, that can have an effect on people's um, disposable income, which is one reason why we have also agreed to a 3% uh, increase proposed uh, public sector pay increase and to lifting the public sector cap. So we are also putting more money into this. I've also made the point to the Scottish Retail Consortium that if all of their members, instead of just most of them, paid the living wage, that would also put more money into the pockets of people who will spend it on those items which you know supermarkets and others provide. So I think it is true to say we do have a challenging uh, economic environment. I think the austerity policies of the UK government contribute to that. Their failure to get a grip of inflation obviously contributes to that. That's one of the reasons why you have uh, an upward pressure um, on pay because uh, inflation now running over 3%. Um, and also, if we, as we have done, say that we are lifting the pay cap and the UK government says that it's not, then of course we don't get the consequentials that would flow from a decision of the UK government to do that. So that also has an effect, of course, on the economy. So there's no question there are challenges in the economy. I, I don't deny that. I think the funding, um, sorry, the Fiscal Commission's projections are perhaps the most pessimistic that I've seen but they're not completely out of the same ballpark as other commentators as well. The challenge we have is to try and exceed uh, those estimates. Thank, thank you. Well, just one final question. The, the Fiscal Commission identified productivity as one of the lower productivity as one of the key issues driving lower growth. Um, given that uh, Scottish Government targets on growth and innovation and productivity have not been uh, met, is the Government looking at uh, a change of direction on economic policy? given these uh, challenging forecasts going forward? I think you're right to identify productivity, although what constitutes um, a strategy to improve productivity is, is debated hotly amongst uh, economists, but I think central to them will be innovation, will be uh, fair work, I think, is a, is a, a precursor of, of uh, productivity. Uh, good management practices and management capacity. Investment, of course, is very important to this as well, and there are other factors. It is a challenge. So in Scotland, I think we've seen an increase in productivity, about 6.6%, I think it is, since 2007, whereas the UK, I think, is less than 1%. That only, however, means that we've more or less closed the gap with the UK, and that's not our target. Our target is to get into the top quartile of the OECD's um, table. So to do that, we have to start to compete with the likes of France and Germany. So things that we're doing in terms of the manufacturing centre, in terms of innovation funding, in terms of funding entrepreneurs, are designed to increase uh, that um, uh, level of productivity. And we realise that's absolutely essential. The other factor, of course, would be internationalisation, expanding the base of businesses within Scotland to export, I think, is also very important. So, yes, we do recognise it's a problem not just for uh, Scotland, of course, it's for the UK, who've also established a number of interventions trying to increase productivity there as well. But the point that was made previously by Tom Arthur is also relevant here, that um, if companies are deferring investment, that's going to have a knock-on effect in, in terms of productivity. If it's investment in new practices and innovation in new capital plant, it's going to have an impact on productivity. So these are not ideal circumstances. Perhaps ideal circumstances never obtain, but we are very focused on increasing productivity. Thank you. Daniel Johnson. First of all, good morning uh, to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd just like to... Uh, uh, start out by looking at some of the recent evidence we've had about uh, the role of Scottish Enterprise and Business Gateway in terms of business support. And in term, specifically, uh, the West Lothian Chamber of Commerce highlighted uh, something of a gap uh, in the perception that Scottish Enterprise is really for large business and Business Gateway is for brand new businesses and, if, and an awful lot of businesses sort of fall between those stools. Do you think that's a, 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 characteriz a characterization even that you would recognise? Um, and if so, what steps do you think need to be taken to address that? I think there is no question that there are some people would have that perception. I think many others wouldn't. But I think you're right, there are some people who think of Business Gateway as for either new or very small or start-up um, uh, companies and Scottish Enterprise for larger companies. That's not actually borne out by some of the companies which Scottish Enterprise engage with, I think, uh, as you also know very well. Um, but I, th I do think you're right to say we have to have, if you like, a, a, an ecosystem of business support which is understandable to people. And I think 
for that reason, we've had obviously the enterprise and skills review, where we've got, I think, the uh, a kind of whole system approach developing. But you still have business gateway, if you like, off to one side. Now that was quite deliberate. We did not include business gateway in that review because business gateways deliver to local authorities. They are their own uh, bodies. They have their own mandate. Uh, but what we have had since the towards the end of the enterprise and skills review is a willingness from COSA representatives to see how we can work together. And I would cite, in relation to that, the very good development of the three Ayrshire councils, which have come together with one um, uh, economic partnership. And they are also tying in very closely to the rest of the ecosystem for which we are responsible. So I think we are moving much more towards um, a, a, an ecosystem which is more understood by everybody and also what we want to get to is a situation where it shouldn't really matter which point of access or contact you make with the system you get the right response from the right person that's what we're aiming towards but yes I think it is uh, a little bit clunky just now and that's what we're trying to resolve. So, so uh, you know given that that's the case can I just ask kind of what sort of view um, the, the, the new uh, strategic board will be taking in terms of overseeing that integration and making sure that there is sort of better and more joined up um, support between Business Gateway and, and Scottish Enterprise? I, I think it will, the approach they will take, and it's for them to take that approach, they've only just been established. And of course, amongst the number is uh, Councillor Stephen Heddle from COSLA. Um, but it will be, uh, if you like, a, a coalition of the willing. It's up to local authorities to choose to do that uh, or to find other ways um, to do that. So the strategic board, of course, can have an oversight, uh, but it's not one of the agencies, um, Business Gateway is not an agency for which they have, if you like, responsibility within the remit. Um, but I think you will see, not least from the inclusion of Stephen Hero, you'll see people, uh, and also from the example that's been given of the issue authorities, now, I, I want to encourage that, so I'm saying to officials that in relation to Skills Development Scotland and other agencies, we want to bolster that as much as we can. So using that example, using the inclusion of um, somebody from COSLA on the strategic board, I think you'll see some uh, very effective joint working. Integration is perhaps the wrong word. We're not forcing anything here. We're going to try and work with local authorities to achieve this. In your answer, you're, you're very much focusing on, on, on business gateway and, and the scope for change there. I'm just wondering how much scope you feel there is for change in Scottish enterprise. I mean, I just, for example, and at this point I probably should declare an interest as a, uh, a director of a, a business with retail interest, but I note that there is no, uh, practically uh, no support given to the retail industry from Scottish enterprise. And I just wonder if that indicates a kind of a, a lack of engagement with more material mature businesses and indeed and my, my reason for asking that is if we are really wanting to boost productivity surely we must focus on mature businesses just as much as we focus on high growth and, 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 and large businesses. I think there's no question if you looked at the if you're able to look at the portfolio of companies for which Scottish Enterprise is responsible you'll see a, a very large number of mature businesses I take your point about the retail sector but I think in terms of mature businesses Scottish Enterprise has got many relationships that go back uh, a very long period of time in fact almost to the inception of Scottish Enterprise your point about what um, you're right to say business gateway is a responsibility of local authorities what we have done through the Enterprise and Skills Review which may well start to challenge the point that you make about Scottish enterprise and its relationship to the retail sector, is to say that those agencies involved in that review should be much more aligned, and that's going to be the central purpose of that board, to make sure they align with each other. Within that, I hope we'll see also joint working with Business Gateway, but the central purpose of the board, and that would I would imagine it would include, it's not for me to lay down um, what they will have in the strategic plan, but it's it's... I would imagine if there's a sector for which is not currently getting the support that it currently requires, um, then they would want to address that. But I don't think it's the case that they don't properly uh, link with mature businesses per se, maybe across sectors, but certainly not per se, because they have quite a number of businesses of that type that they manage. Just my final question is, I mean, again, you know, focusing on Scottish Enterprise, I mean, we, we also heard evidence that, that, that some businesses you know, find it difficult and frustrating to, to deal with Scottish Enterprise just in terms of the, the way that they work and the way account management works, with there being sort of six-month lead times between kind of requesting a decision for that decision to be made, and, and especially for, for, for um, uh, businesses which are seeking to grow, startups, th that's just not something they can work with. Indeed, I, I, would, I would imagine that even for large businesses, while they might be able to cope with it, it's not something that they, in, they enjoy. I mean, again, do you think there's a, a need to look at the way 
that um, account management works, the kind of the approach for, for Scottish enterprise, and, and do you think you know, six-month lead times and decisions are, are acceptable to business? Um, it's interesting because this is a discussion that you and I and the convener had at Hustings before the election last year, if you remember. Um, and I, I'm sure that there are ways in which Scottish enterprise can improve and a six month lead time seems long, although sometimes that will be to do with uh, diligence having to be undertaken. But I accept the general point that um, Scottish enterprise can um, improve um, areas of its work. And they would say that. And perhaps one obvious way is the number of account managed uh, companies that they have perhaps doesn't cover a wide enough spectrum of the economy in Scotland. And I think they are very alive to that. The one thing I would say is uh, since we had that debate in that uh, hustings, obviously I've had responsibility for Scottish enterprise. And despite having previously been a board member of Scottish enterprise, Fourth Valley, I'm much more aware now of some excellent what they do and often it's unreported because it's commercially confidential but they save businesses they save jobs on a regular basis but of course like everyone else they can improve and perhaps it's in that area of the amount of coverage do they have to do very few intensely or do more less intensely that that's one of the areas which i'm sure the strategic board uh, upon which bob keeler the, the um, chair of scottish enterprise also sits i'm sure that's one thing they'll be addressing well, can I just say I'm very glad that that hustings made such a positive impact, Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps we could move on from the hustings. I think it might have been the hustings to be at, since uh, if I recall, most of the candidates, most of the parties who were there were elected. And uh, here we are discussing the matters two years later. Um, I'll move on to a question from Colin Beatty. Thank you, Peter. Cabinet Secretary, just turning to the business gateway, a number of uh, chambers have... Uh, express concerns about the level of uh, business gateway support in their areas. Um, given that uh, business gateway services are delivered through local authorities, how is the 2018-19 budget going to deliver uh, better or good quality consistent services uh, across the board? Well, that latter uh, point uh, which is made is one for local authorities. Of course, the government has a role to pay and, uh, play in terms of the settlement which is reached with local authorities, but it, the delivery of those services is for uh, local authorities. And speaking as a former uh, local government uh, council leader, um, we weren't too happy when the government prescribed too closely um, what we should or shouldn't do. But I, I think it's also acknowledged amongst local authorities that at the very least that the provision of business gateway services across uh, the country is not consistent and that some do exceptionally well and others um, haven't put the same level of resource for example into uh, business gateway so i think it's right that these matters uh, of local economic development are managed by those who are closest to the local economy Having said that, the Enterprise and Business Support Project from the Enterprise and Skills Review is also working to help provide that ecosystem that I talked to, uh, about around the user. And Business Gateway is a core partner um, in that. And I think that will allow, uh, on an ongoing basis, the improvement of products and services that will help ensure good business, good quality business gateway services. And going back to the previous point, if it's the case that those elsewhere within that ecosystem like Scottish Enterprise, if there are gaps in the provision that they have, if there are things that they do exceptionally well, and if the Business Gateway, with I mean, they used to be part of the same service previously, obviously, if they can learn from what's done there, then that's got to be a positive. So I think the whole system approach that we've undertaken will help lead to an improvement in terms of all the different elements of that system and I would hope that Business Gateway, although it is for local authorities, would be part of that improvement as well. Looking at the, the evidence that's been provided by the different local authorities and so on, and this is my interpretation from that, it appears that Business Gateway is better in an urban environment rather than a rural environment. Would you agree with that? Um, I, I think there's probably an impact of what Highlands and Islands Enterprise have done in relation to that question. They've been seen to be very effective um, in a rural environment, but of course there are business gateway there. And I think probably more frequently um, they're co-located in an urban environment. But I, no, I, I'm not sure I would. Um, uh, maybe a perception, that I'm not disagreeing with the perception, but um, maybe there's something about the level of economies of scale in terms of delivering a service that is easier in an urban environment. I, I would ex accept that, but 
No, I think, as I said in my previous answer, I think there is certainly the perception of inconsistency across the country. Some areas do exceptionally well and others less so. Now, I think it's important that we try and help those that do it less well, even those that acknowledge they've done it less well, and perhaps, and I don't want to criticise anybody in this, perhaps that's a tacit acknowledgement of the Ayrshire Partnership, which has developed that they could do things better working in partnership. I think what we want to do is try and make it as consistent as possible across the country whilst observing local government's right to deliver these services. Just to take a, a specific example here, looking at uh, Keith, Keith Ness and the Borders, both these local authorities seem to be indicating a lack of business gateway resources. Now, obviously, that, that's, that's, that's very critical. If, if you don't have enough advisors, if you don't have the resources to back up these advisors, then they're not going to be able to deliver. And just looking at the evidence from these two specifically, it would appear that that is an issue. I, I, I don't accept that. Well, may, maybe the, the resources aren't the same in those areas, but that, those are decisions of the local authorities. So a settlement was made at the point that they took on responsibility for Business Gateway, and it was at that point local authorities could decide what resource they wanted to allocate to that. Now, um, I, I'm not saying this is specifically in relation to the two local authority areas you mentioned, but maybe they've put less resource into it, um, but they've made that choice to do that. I'm not pretending, of course, there are not constraints on resources, but they have made that choice to do that. But it might be worth um, hearing from uh, Mary McCallan as to the original dispensation when they took on that function in the first place. I don't know if you were uh, working in this area at the time, I Mary. I was, and I'm happy, to, um, I'm happy to go through that, but you just have to excuse me because, because it's a local government function now, I am going reaching back into the back of my mind to the history of it. So as you know, we handed over responsibility for Business Gateway to local government 2008-9. Um, I think, I can't be sure, but I think the funding settlement at that stage was around 16, 15, 16 million. Um, and it went into the local government settlement. It became a local government function. Um, and the whole point of that was, uh, the, the, the thought behind it was actually, uh, in local economies, it was helpful to have local control of business gateway because it could be flexed in order to meet the needs of particular circumstances across the country. Um, and as the Cabinet Secretary has said, uh, it is arguably a variable service, but actually it can be variably very good. Um, so he has mentioned the Ayrshire um, uh, example. Uh, I think what you would find if you went and spoke to the Ayrshires, they would say, uh, business Gateway isn't the only thing we do in the local economic development space. We do a lot of activity. Uh, business Gateway is the front end of that. They've chosen to integrate it very closely with what they do as a council, not just in North Ayrshire, but across the three Ayrshires, and also to what, work very closely with Scottish Enterprise. So, uh, you know, it's fundamental. It's there. It's the public sector facing bit of service to small business mainly, but not only. Um, and it is really about working very, very closely across the ecosystem that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, because there is a linkage between Business Gateway and Scottish Enterprise in terms of growth companies. And what Business Gateway does is to identify companies, help them grow, and then pass them on to Scottish Enterprise for, specialist, uh, for, spe for more specialist uh, support. I think the other thing I mentioned, if I could convene, is that uh, local authorities tend to deliver it in different ways. Some have used trusts, economic development trusts in their area. Some have just um, put it out to tender. Um, and there is a, if you looked at the spending per head across the different local authorities, I'd find, I think you'd find a remarkable range, um, although that is, that is the right of local authorities to decide how to do that. What we want to try and get to is a position where we can learn from the best uh, who, who's done it the most effectively and try and um, get that practice across different local authorities. Given the importance of Business Gateway, working in conjunction with Scottish Enterprise. How do we monitor success or failure in each of the council areas? Well, I think that is for the various ways in which we monitor the performance of local authorities, whether it's the Accounts Commission or others to do. It's not um, uh, directly... Well, this committee can do it, obviously, by having an evidence uh, inquiry session, or local government committee could do that, but that is a local authority function uh, for them to do that. But it may be that research on the level of uh, spend and level of activity might be quite um, useful for the, for the committee. Thank you. And Jamie Halko Johnson. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in their evidence, uh, all of the chambers highlighted uh, problems with skills and recruitment uh, within their local areas. And I'm just wondering what the, the budget specifically uh, looks at to address that. Uh, particularly into relation, uh, in relation to kind of workforce planning and changes in terms of 
technical, demographic, maybe regional uh, kind of issues? Well, it's a very good point, and obviously from your part of the country, you've got extremely low unemployment, uh, high employment, and that produces its own pressures in terms of skills. Uh, I think we're doing a number of things that it might be worth hearing from uh, Hugh McAleen in relation to some of that, but I think we are further expanding the modern apprenticeship programme, for example, to 30,000 starts a year. Um, SDS is working with partners to deliver foundation apprenticeships, which combine the benefits of school, college and work-based education. And although that some of this spills into uh, my colleague John Swinney's area, he has announced an ambition that by the end of 2019, up to 5,000 young people will start a foundation apprenticeship. That's up from 351 starts this year. We also have the Flexible uh, Workforce Development Fund, which we introduced last year. Um, and that will be delivered through the college sector, bringing it together with uh, industry to better support uh, in-work training to improve skills there. I think also the new, the new um, schemes for which we have responsibility in terms of employment are very important for getting people further removed um, from the jobs market uh, into um, productive work, not just into it, but staying within it as well, which of course helps improve the general pool of skilled labour that's uh, available. So there's a number of uh, different interventions. Uh, much of this work is undertaken, of course, by colleges and universities as well. But I don't know if, can we, if, if Hugh McLean wants to mention something in relation to that. Yeah, I mean, um, I think a key element of the, the Enterprise and Skills Review is around um, skills planning systems. So we have got, I guess, two main bodies who are involved in skills plan and skills commissioning, if you like to call it that, which is Skills Development Scotland and Scottish Funding Council. Through the, um, through the Enterprise and Skills Review, we have identified the need um, to bring their planning much closer together and to link what employers need in the short, medium and long term, what the economy needs in the short, medium and long term, um, across the two organisations and at best, you know, as best we can map out provisions so that um, people coming through the system are better placed to go into the jobs that are there, not just now, but in the future. Um, that's a, a challenging thing to do. I think there are some clear differences within the system. Um, so if you look at um, the apprenticeship system, for example, that is very much tied to a job. Um, so. If an employer is offering a job, then that's what's an offer. If you look at the college system or the university system, it's much more linked to learner choice um, and what it is learners want to do. Um, aligning those two systems that are possibly driven by two different things is a challenge, but the Funding Council and SDS are heavily committed to that work and are, are moving it forward. Um, other things that we're doing um, are around bringing employers closer to the, the education and skills system. So as part of developing young workforce, we've got 21 um, industry-led regional groups across the country, which are about having employers much more engaged in um, education and young people and more focused on recruitment of them. And also within Skills Development Scotland, we've got the Scottish Apprenticeship Advisory Board, which comprises um, employers who are heavily involved in and interested in the development of um, apprenticeships. So bringing employers much more closely into the running of the system um, as partners, as um, not simply representative bodies, but going actually into employers who know their region, who know their sector, um, and actually bringing them much more into what we're doing. I think I'd also mention, um, convene in response to the question, that uh, during the Enterprise and the Skills Review, there was uh, some work done on the tension between investment in, in tertiary education and production, if you like, of graduates, uh, as opposed to um, a apprenticeships and other skills training, and whether a greater return on investment might come from uh, skills training as opposed to graduates. We, I think, came top of the league table internationally in terms of graduates. Um, but the question was whether investment at uh, other levels uh, in terms of skills would be more economically beneficial. It's probably too early to say, having made that very substantial investment in graduates. But it is clear to me that a number of companies I talk to, especially the larger ones, are more inclined now to have very strong apprenticeship programmes, sometimes in preference to graduate programmes, because they, they um, say that they, f they feel they get more loyalty and people don't come expecting to be 
MD within two or three years um, if they're postgraduate or graduates, um, whereas apprenticeships, uh, they sometimes feel they're more effective. So that tension is there. We recognise the benefit of both, and in fact, we've bought both together through the graduate apprenticeship um, uh, scheme as well. But um, it, there is that tension there. Um, thank you. Um, I think it's interesting to hear about the kind of greater employee involvement, which is obviously very important. Um, you mentioned foundation apprenticeships, and something that's been raised with me a number of times, uh, particularly in the rural areas, has been the uh, limited choice. And I was just wondering whether that's going to um, that's likely to expand. There's going to likely to be greater choice, particularly in kind of rural areas going forward. <coughs> we were looking to expand foundation apprenticeship opportunities across the country to. 5,000 a year by the end of 2019 and there will be expansion in the year ahead towards that target. Um, I think um, all local authorities will be involved um, and SDS are looking at the range of frameworks available so the occupations involved grows. I think there are challenges um, around anything which involves travel in or more rural communities, there are extra costs there, um, but um, there is no um, there is no um, distinction between what we're trying to do in different parts of the country. We are trying to um, first of all um, introduce the program, get young people, parents, and schools more um, aware of and familiar with the program, and grow it quite significantly as a as a new. Um, pathway coming out of the senior phase into um, post-16 education through work-based learning. would hope to see a widening of the subject choices you would have thought. Of in that yeah, I think um, Skills Development Scotland are um, exploring um, routes into some of the, what are, I don't know really like the term, but traditionally called the craft apprenticeships. Um, so that's um, apprenticeships in um, some of the construction sectors and, and others. I, I don't really like the term because I think modern apprenticeships um, offer a range of opportunities right across the um, right across the economy, and I think distinguishing between them does the sectors and the people who work in the sectors a bit of disservice. But that's kind of how they're traditionally um, referred to. Interesting to know. We'll get feedback on what you think of the particular demands, especially in, in, in your area. It's a very substantial expansion, so 351 last year, up to 5,000 in the 2019 is a pretty rapid um, expansion and ambition, and it should be taking account of what local needs are. It's been led, as I say, by the Deputy First Minister, but if you want to give any feedback on what you think of the particular areas of demand, happy to pass that back. I mean, this is something that's been, as I say, brought up a number of times by different organisations, particularly, obviously, in my own area of the Highlands and Islands, and I'm happy to, to write to you and give you more, because that would be very useful. Um, th another issue, sorry, that, that, that came up was that, um, uh, in the evidence from the Chambers, was that uh, there was a relatively low awareness and appetite for uh, members' businesses for kind of exploring um, export opportunities. I'm just wondering what the, the government's doing to ensure that... Um, that we're kind of boosting um, interna internationalisation and also looking kind of particularly with things that's going on everywhere else to explore kind of new markets. Yeah, it's a huge area of concern. So uh, the First Minister regularly quotes, I think it's the 70 uh, businesses in Scotland which account for half of our exports. And I think the, uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but until recently, certainly about 7% only of our uh, businesses uh, export. So, and we've consistently said this internationalisation has got to be a part of both building pro productivity and ensuring future growth. It's also a good way, going back to the productivity point, of if you're exporting into more efficient, more productive markets, then it tends to make you more productive and efficient as well. So um, we have done a number of things. I've mentioned the SDI expansion in Europe, and also we have the local uh, and regional export partnership pilots. Um, now, these are things which you're undertaking, but they also build on things which the industry does. So, for example, the Scotch Whiskey Association does a, a mentoring scheme to help with smaller companies in the supply chain um, take them through the exporting uh, side of things. That Whether it's... It's hard to know exactly what the inhibition is. There are some companies that simply don't want to export. They're happy with a domestic market and they don't intend to go further than that. But if you've got 7% in Scotland and yet 70% in Bavaria, then there's something 
uh, going on there that we have to address. So I've mentioned the partnerships, the expansion we have in Europe. I've mentioned the London and Dublin hubs, which we have um, established. Um, also examples would be, I suppose, like when uh, we went to Abu Dhabi um, a number of months ago, we had an SDI event, which uh, we had 80 Scottish businesses, small and medium-sized businesses there many of whom would not have gone across to Abu Dhabi unless you'd got that support. Um, for one thing, once you're there, you've got six months before you'll be, your visa's expired, so you've got to make the best of that six months. So we've provided through SDI and others support in terms of what you really have to do if you're seeking to establish yourself in other areas. And we've also uh, undertaken a round of uh, appointments of trade envoys to help uh, at the first meeting with one of those um, last week to help local companies become aware of market opportunities. So it's a very big challenge for us, internationalisation, and the more we can do it, then the more productive we'll become. Follow up from Tom Arthur. Yeah, just a supplementary on the issue <coughs> of skills, Cabinet Secretary. Um, an evidence uh, we received um, from the Edinburgh Chambers of Commerce that stated that since Brexit, our universities and hoteliers have raised concerns about access to the migrant labour market, social cohesion and currency that makes working in the UK and Scotland less attractive. And I think it was indeed, it was today or yesterday, we learned that in the second quarter of this year, net immigration to the UK from the EU has fallen to its lowest level since records began. I just wonder if you can share with the committee if the UK government has indicated how it intends to attract skilled migrants to the UK and indeed to Scotland post-Brexit. Uh, no, and I'm sure uh, the member is aware of the ongoing debate there is about whether um, the use of if you like, more discretion, more powers in Scotland uh, for immigration uh, would be uh, a useful way to go forward. I, I fundamentally think that it would, and actually a previous administration undertook the Fresh Talent Initiative, which was in its own terms, I think, very successful in doing just that. So I, I think it's a huge issue. And if you travel around, uh, you know, I was in Orkney a number of months back, and they said, had we not had EU national serving the hotel that we're staying, we would have had breakfast or checked in or had rooms to go to, essentially, um, in a fit state. So uh, absolutely important, especially, I think, in rural areas. Over and above that, I think, in my own consistency, going to the university, uh, Southern University, both in terms of the staff they can attract, they know there are staff that have said they're not going to come, uh, that are thinking about being appointed to there. There are staff that are leaving, and, of course, there are um, students um, uh, choosing not to come to those uh, universities as well. So it's having a huge um, impact already. I think we'll probably only know the full extent of it in future uh, months and years. Uh, and there is, I think, action that can be taken. And I think one of those things is, as with um, in Canada, where provinces have particular powers, if we had powers um, to uh, attract people, um, then, uh, and also going back to previous points that we made by members about productivity, it's very clear that productivity is impacted hugely by uh, net um, uh, Im immigration. So, I, I think it's a very important point. Hopefully, as we now move forward into the, uh, further Brexit discussions, this will become uh, something which is. Um, the UK government shows some willingness to move. Of course, in the United States, they had an equivalent of the post-study work visa, which they abolished or stopped, and then almost immediately restarted it again when they realised the impact it would have on their economy. So I think this is a huge um, area of concern uh, for us. But as yet, there is no movement from the UK government in terms of uh, powers to Scotland uh, or elsewhere, as far as I'm aware. Uh, we'll wait and see what happens in terms of uh, Northern Ireland uh, to allow them to keep that flow of people coming to the country that can add so much to the economy. Um, Dean Lockhart. Yeah, just a quick follow up on that point. Um, on the skills gap, what analysis has the Scottish Government done in terms of now that the UK, or sorry, Scotland is the highest tax part of the UK for skilled workers, those above uh, 26,000, what impact would that have and what analysis has the Government done in terms of um, how that might uh, disincentivise skilled workers coming to Scotland? Hey, I'll maybe get Hugh to talk about the analysis, including the work that we've done on the skills strategy, which is fairly uh, recently produced. But I would say this is, uh, I, I don't agree this is the case. I think the idea that people are looking at tax rates in Scotland and saying, I'm not going to come, um, I'm a skilled person, I'm not going to come because of the tax changes. If you look at the tax changes last week, uh, I think it's about 70% of people, um, if I get my figures right, will be paying less tax. And of course, the interrelationship between tax 
and a 3% increase for many people, um, not everybody, but for many people in terms of their pay, more than overcomes that tax. So I think we've got a very competitive tax regime. If you also take the fact that in Scotland, the average council tax is about £400 a year less than the UK level, if you take into fact you don't pay tuition fees, if you take into account you, the fact you don't pay prescription charges, and I don't agree, and I would be interested to know from Mr Lockhart, he cited over the weekend 393,000 employees that were police officers, train drivers and uh, nurses, I think it was. I don't know where this 393,000, perhaps you can let us know where they came from, but I am pretty confident we're not, allowed to, we're not about to see these people. Of course, in relation to nurses, we paid higher in Scotland in any event, even before any tax changes, where he sees those people wanting to leave Scotland even though, though they have the benefits which I've just described. But even if there are 393,000 train drivers, nurses uh, and police officers, because I don't believe they are. Uh, I was just referring to the government's own uh, tax paper that shows a behavioural impact uh, or uh, resulting from uh, the increase in the additional rate and the increase in the higher rate. Um, I don't want to go into that detail right now, but the Scottish Government's very own analysis shows there will be a, a behavioural impact, people either not coming to Scotland or making different investment decisions, and the area that behavioural impact will have is on skilled workers. So all the commentary on the budget highlights the fact that this will have an adverse impact on the skills gap. Yeah, I don't accept that. And of course, one of the tax changes was a reduction in the basic rate of tax. So <clears throat> presumably that would have a beneficial impact. Where I think there is um, uh, some merit to what uh, Dean Lockhart is saying is at the very top range. And that's why it was very uh, finely judged, because if you start to go beyond that, as was said last week, then you can start to see... Uh, behavioural changes. So they have been factored into analysis that have been undertaken both in the tax papers which have been put forward, although that really falls into the portfolio of my colleague uh, Derek Mackay. Analysis was done on that, consultation was undertaken in relation to that as to the impact it might have uh, in different sections of the uh, jobs market. But um, I don't believe, and I, and I actually would question why somebody would want to continuously talk about Scotland being the highest tax part of the UK for now, best part of two years. And what effect do you think that has on the Scottish economy and why they want to try and achieve that effect? I think it's wrong to say it, uh, both because of the effect it could have and because it's not based in fact. OK, thank you. I've just referred to the Scottish Fiscal Commission five-year forecast in terms of existing policy clearly isn't working, Cabinet Secretary. So that's why I suggested earlier it's now time for the government to look at a new economic uh, strategy because if we, um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts are to be true, the, your, your government will have £2 billion less money to spend on public, uh, public services. Um, so, sorry, um, just perhaps to follow up on the, the issues raised by Tom Arthur, um, I, I think you referred to immigration as being entirely positive was the impression given, but uh, what about the impact in terms of, first of all, lower wages as a result of there being lots of labour available, and second, the issue of the tens of thousands in Scotland who are unemployed, untrained, um, and what steps is the government taking to address those two issues, and the opportunity presented by leaving the EU? Yeah, I think, first of all, in relation to employment, um, I think maybe I've, I've mentioned already some of the employment schemes which we have responsibility for already and those for which we're about to assume responsibility and how they're designed to try and make sure that that section of the workforce that's further removed from the market, um, jobs market, either through disabilities or other reasons, is able to access uh, job opportunities. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there are this... Well, the two things can't be true in relation to a labour shortage and um, huge numbers of unemployed people. We have unemployment sitting at around 4% just now, although we also have some underemployment and we have some insecure employment as well. I acknowledge those points. But it, the, both things can't be true, that we have um, a, also have at the same time a, a labour shortage. I think there is a labour shortage in certain areas. Uh, and I, I don't think it's the case. And I think most of the studies, and I'm happy to um, have officials look at this and come back to you, Convener, uh, show the fact that uh, immigration has driven down wages. I think the, the evidence is to the contrary, in fact. I'd also point out to the fact that in Scotland, we have something like five times as many companies per, um, per head 
um, that have signed up to the living wage. We have the highest proportion of uh, people paid the living wage, 81.6% in Scotland, compared to around 78%. I wouldn't do as, as Dean Lockhart would do and say that's a crisis for the rest of the UK, or their higher unemployment levels, a crisis for the rest of the UK, in which it seems to be a crisis for Scotland, if we have any indicators which are different from uh, the UK. But I think we do have higher numbers of people that are paid the living wage, um, and we have a higher level of employment. That is also true for female employment. It's also true for youth employment as well. So um, I think there are still challenges. One of the big ones, I'd go back to previous answers, is the issue of uh, labour shortages. Uh, I have had certainly anecdotal evidence of people saying they've advertised a number of times for staff and they found it increasingly difficult to get staff over recent months. So that doesn't seem to fit with huge numbers of unskilled people coming to this country and... and um, you know, having that kind of distorting effect on the jobs market. I think it has uh, has been absolutely beneficial to Scotland to have the benefits of free movement within the, the EU. But I, I accept that it's, it's a fairly complex set of um, circumstances, but uh, in terms of forward planning and looking at the, the issues within the country in terms of there are areas where there's unemployment, um, lack of training, which are not necessarily the same areas where there's a, a need for workers. And if one looks at other EU countries, they perhaps deal with these things more successfully because equally they have internal issues in terms of distribution of jobs, distribution of, of workers and so forth. Um, so perhaps if, if you could follow up on that, that, that would be welcome. Um, I'll turn now to Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Convener. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just a Returning to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, um, they note that apart from the change to public sector pay policy, uh, their judgment is that the policies announced in the budget are not of a large enough magnitude to have a significant aggregate impact on the Scottish economy, and particularly with respect to forecasts of earnings uh, and employment. Do you agree with that? Hey. No, I think they will have an impact. That's what they're designed to try and achieve. We obviously, have a difference of view, um, or the SFC have got a difference of view from many other economic commentators uh, as well. So I think what we are doing, whether it's a National uh, Manufacturing Centre of Excellence with a lightweight manufacturing centre, uh, the money we're putting into um, the low carbon economy or to business research and development, these are designed to have uh, an impact on growth. I would point out, that, uh, again, that I think there are other very major influences on the Scottish economy over which we have very little control, so control over inflation, the fact that the UK's national debt has gone nearly to £2 trillion in the last seven years, the fact that its credit rating has gotten substantially worse over the last few years, um, the fact we don't control corporation tax and many other taxes or even tax allowances, those do inhibit the extent to which you can affect change. I don't deny that point. But I think the measures which we are taking are designed to try and increase productivity uh, increase growth and, of course, increase well-paid and secured employment in Scotland. They also make the point that um, they do accept that changes to public sector pay policy uh, could be could have a, a some impact on the economy. However, they noted that they didn't receive details of that policy until towards the end of the economic forecasting process, and as a result, um, they couldn't really factor that into their economic forecasts. Why, why was that policy decision given to them so late? That would be part of the consideration of the budget for which Derek Mackay is responsible, which is question best asked of him, I think. I, I will do. Um, moving to the, um, the question of, of pay, the Scottish Trade Unions uh, Congress um, questioned why the uh, additional revenues that the budget raises primarily fund tax cuts for uh, businesses, and they note that £100 million of additional revenue raised has essentially been used to provide um, cuts to non-domestic um, rates. What, what economic assessment has been made as to the economic impact of cuts to non-domestic rates? I think we've just seen a very substantial review through the Barclay Review of uh, non-domestic rates, which I think has been very useful in a number of areas. And I think the output from that has led to uh, Derek Mackay introducing a number of different measures which will leave us with, uh, I think, the most competitive uh, local business uh, taxation system across the UK. It's uh, benefits, for example, you will no longer pay 
rates when you've um, improved or um, expanded your premises for up to a year. Of course, we have the small business bonus scheme, which I know you've raised previously, but I think we have uh, ample evidence that had an impact right through the recession when many companies didn't have um, enough otherwise to have kept somebody on or to take somebody new on when the important thing was to retain employment. Um, maybe that's one of the factors why we have uh, better employment figures than the UK does. Um, so I think that, and of course, a very rigorous analysis of the Barclay Review, which was a huge consultation exercise as well, has given us a very good idea of the benefits of a competitive uh, local taxation regime and non-domestic rates amongst that. So my, my question was about an economic assessment. I, Barclay didn't do an economic assessment of his proposals. Um, I'm just wondering if the government's done any economic assessment. In other words, what, what the impact of this will be on the economy. Obviously, um, these businesses are paying less tax, and that's presumed they're very welcome. But the economic impact of that is, as it appears to me, hasn't been assessed. I'm happy to come back on that, but I think I would refer to the point I made previously about um, the retaining uh, employment during the course of uh, uh, the recession, which was very important. So it had the economic impact, of course, of bolstering employment. I'm happy to come back to the member on that. I don't know if Mary McCallum has got anything you want to add to that. I think, I think we, could, we could write back to you and give you uh, more information. That would be helpful, thanks. Um, turning to the Enterprise and Skills Review, obviously this new strategic board is going to be, um, has a lot of um, hope invested in it. Um, what, what role will it have in assessing the um, amount of resources that goes into enterprise agencies and how that's uh, how value for money is assessed. Well, I think the, uh, as I said to Parliament previously, the decision on the budgets for each of the agencies will still be a ministerial decision. Um, however, I do think there'll be a lot more uh, collaboration undertaken. So, if the one of the main functions of the Enterprise and Skills uh, Strategic Board is to um, ensure there's alignment between the different agencies and to improve the general e level of economic performance. That will necessarily involve uh, becoming involved in how effective the different things that different agencies do. Uh, and of course, they will have their, first of all, the strategic plan, but they will also have an interface with ministers as well. So I think it will be a collaborative effort to make sure that the resources are used most effectively, but it will still be ministers that decide the individual allocations for each of the agencies. So, but a, a big part of the, or a substantial part of the increase in the budgets this year is financial transactions. And I'm just thinking financial transactions is something that can be used quite flexibly, um, and things can happen quite quickly. Um, I mean, we saw the situation around Ferguson Shipyard or the, the Alcan plant in, in Fort William. Um, I mean, will there be, will the strategic board have a role in um, allowing flexibility in how that money is deployed. So, for example, if you, in your budget, let's say next year, um, allocate half of the financial resources to Highlands and Islands Enterprise, half to the south of Scotland, or a third to each or whatever, will you be able to have any flexibility between those agencies if, for example, um, significant opportunities arise in South Scotland? Well, to that extent, it would be, of course, higher involved in the south of Scotland as well. Um, to that extent, it would be... Uh, obviously for the individual agencies who can collaborate just now, but take some of the examples that you mentioned, or take BIFAB, for example. I think the strategic board would be much more interested in seeing the extent to which the different agencies work together in relation to that. They might also have a view, of course, on whether um, providing that level of support um, to um, the renewable sector in particular, to the extent that BIFAB are involved, uh, not just in that, but involved in the renewable sector. So they might want to take a view on which of the sectors they think are most uh, effectively supported in order to achieve the government's ambitions and to achieve their uh, central aim, which is to improve economic performance generally. They'll want to take a view on that. They will certainly want to take a view on whether the agencies have worked more effectively together. They will not be able to direct one agency to pass money to another agency for a particular priority. That's not... Um, it may be possible within agencies and uh, for ministers to become involved in that discussion as well, but that will not be the role of the strategic board. But the, the, f the main function, uh, I think, as we discussed many times in this Enterprise and Schools Review, is to try and achieve that alignment. Now, that alignment, I think, will necessarily include things like secondments and joint working as between the different agencies, so they become much more aware of the activities of each other. And that may well lead to um, 
other collaborations of the type that you describe, but that will be for those agencies to take forward. It will not be something that's directed by uh, the strategic board. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, Jackie Bailey. I wonder whether I could return to the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecast for growth, because um, at less than 1%, that's the lowest trend growth that they're forecasting that we've seen in 60 years. So whilst I don't want to talk about crisis, I think it's significantly serious to command our attention. Um, it, the Cabinet Secretary suggested that this was an overly pessimistic forecast. Does he have a different target that he's working to? And if he, he feels it's overly pessimistic, in what area does he feel the, the Fiscal Commission have perhaps got it slightly wrong? Hey, no, I didn't say that. What I said was that they were more pessimistic than other economic commentators, and there are quite a few, um, a, including Fraser Valander, for example, who have higher growth forecasts. Uh, and our aim is to try and be in the top quartile. So that's, it, it depends on the relative strength of those other economies, of course, to do that. So what's very important for us is to lay out how we think we can achieve higher uh, economic growth. Now, economic growth is very important, but it's also very important that you have the requisite level of employment in the country. That's very important for equality. It's important for inclusion as well. So there are other um, targets we also have, and of course, driving down uh, unemployment, driving up opportunities for those, especially those furthest from the job market, is also extremely important. Making sure people are involved in a fair work environment, are being paid, uh, for example, the living wage. These are other um, aspirations, of course, that we, we have too. But what we're doing in terms of the manufacturing manufacturing centre, in terms of increasing business R&D, these are designed to improve on the current levels of, um, of economic growth. So I acknowledge um, the um, Fiscal Commission's projections. They are, by their own admission, I think, uh, more pessimistic than many others. It's our job to try and exceed them, and that would be by the methods which I've mentioned. Okay. Um, you'll be aware that the Fiscal Commission also consider that the problems are structural. And if they're structural, they will take much longer to resolve. Indeed, you know, one of the, the main methods of increasing productivity um, might be a problem for us because there's been strong growth in, in the labour market previously. Fiscal Commission think we're at capacity or indeed over capacity, and that is hidden, actually, a weakness in prog productivity. Do you recognise that productivity is determined by output per hour has actually declined in the last seven quarters? Uh, well, yeah, I think I've mentioned already over the last 10 years the increase that we've seen in productivity, but I've also acknowledged it is not enough. It barely and doesn't even quite close the gap with the rest of the UK, so I've acknowledged that point. Um, and uh, also there is still that gap between the productivity that we have in the UK and that we have, say, in France or Germany, Holland or Norway. So I, I acknowledge, uh, um, and the fact that it's... Every government, including um, previous devolved governments and previous governments at Westminster, have struggled with this. So I understand the long-term nature of the issue. I think the fact that we have managed to see an improvement gives us some confidence about the measures that we might take to try and improve further, and those are about increasing skill levels, about increasing business R&D, um, about increasing manufacturing, which I think for too, may, uh, for too long uh, many governments just wrote off the idea of, of manufacturing and left ourselves to be essentially a service-based economy alone. So I think we are. those are the actions that we are taking, given the fact that we do acknowledge there's a job to do in terms of productivity. Let me come back to productivity, because I think you said twice, or it may, may just be once, and I've misheard you, that productivity was improving. The, the last seven quarters, productivity has declined. And in fact, the only reason you're going up the table is because UK productivity has got weaker. So actually, if you look at, and the source for this, Scottish Government Productivity Series, November 2017. So the current statistics. Productivity has actually got worse. Is that right? Well, it depends on the time scale you take it over. I've mentioned it's increased by 6.6% 6 .6 by 2007. Now, you might said want in the to... last seven consecutive quarters. Yeah. Well, you, you're picking that time scale. What's happened during that time scale, I wonder? What, what big event has taken place during that time? We've already had discussion about the number of people no longer coming to this country, whether it's in terms of universities or some of the other sectors as well. Most commentators acknowledge the fact there's been an impact from Brexit in terms of productivity already, uh, not least through the um, uh, one of the biggest generators of productivity both in the rest of the UK, in fact to a greater extent than the rest of the UK and Scotland, has been population growth. And we are seeing a major impact on population growth just now through Brexit. So 
yes, I'm acknowledging there are challenges. I'm not sure what else there is for us to debate around that. I acknowledge there are challenges. I've laid out what I think we should do to try and address that challenge. Yes, you're right. More recently, uh, you've said the last seven quarters uh, not growing, but since 2007, it's grown by 6.6%. So we have to try and learn the lessons of why that's the case in both those time spans and try and improve upon it. Um, I'll move on, convener, but, but might I observe that the drop in productivity um, started before there was a referendum on leaving the European Union. Um, so I'm concerned about a, a downward trend that started before that. Um, it, I want to come, come back to exploring the choices we have, because I think this is, this is a huge issue for us. Um, if we accept there are structural problems, and those structural problems will take a long time um, to come through and grow the economy, then the choice left to us is to actually raise the tax take. Do you therefore foresee for the, the next few years income tax having to rise in order for us to protect the block grant that we get from the UK government? Uh, no, I thank you. Uh, first of all, it's up to, um, obviously, uh, future uh, finance secretaries and future governments uh, in terms of decisions on tax. But I think you only raise tax for particular purposes to try and achieve uh, something uh, in the, the economy or, or in society. I think uh, tax itself is, a, if you like, the hallmark of a civilised society. So I think you do it for particular purposes. So I don't think you should give general commitments to increase um, tax, uh, the tax take in future. I think it has to respond to the environment in which you find yourself. We find ourselves with a further, another year's cut in our resource budget. Uh, we find ourselves with all the problems which uh, Brexit has produced. And of course, your point about the seven uh, your seven quarters assumes that that's been a continuous thing, that that's had one effect that's caused that. I'm not sure how to explain previous quarters in the last 10 years where there's been a dip in there and increase as well. So it, it depends on what you see as being the cause for that. But no, I don't think we necessarily have to continually increase uh, our tax take year on year. It will depend on the particular circumstances of the economy and the particular demands of society. OK. I think the point that we're all going to have to consider is if, if we can't grow the economy as quickly as we would like because there are structural problems, then in order to protect our block grant, we need to increase per capita the income tax take. Um, so there are some stark choices ahead. Convener, I'll move on quickly to infrastructure. Um, could I ask... Well, in, in perhaps you could wrap it up in response to this question. Um, uh, could you tell me how the Scottish Government will use its borrowing powers for 1819? Um, and I, am I correct in saying that already 234 million has been allocated um, to make up the shortfall in ESA 10 projects? Because, of course, you'll recall that they were reclassified. So I'm just looking to see if, if the 234 million is already accounted for in 1819 borrowing. And just to add to that, um, I'm wondering whether you are using NPD as a financing model going forward. Hey. First of all, just to come back to the previous point, the point that Jackie Bailey makes about the pressures on the budget um, from economic growth, of course, a big determinant of uh, the income tax receipts is a level of employment as distinct from economic growth. I'm not saying the two things aren't related, but we have very high employment just now, so um, that itself doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be that particular pressure in relation to um, the future, uh, fu there are bound to be pressures in future budgets, of course, but I think the two things are quite distinct. Um, in terms of um, e the borrowing powers that we have and how we intend to uh, use those, of course, we've once again agreed to, uh, Derek Mackay set out, we will borrow the maximum available to us under devolved powers, around £450 million. Um, and following the agreement of the fiscal framework, um, we have the ability to go up to, to £3 billion. In relation to ESA 10, uh, I, I'm not sure how this is something that the Scottish Government should have foreseen this. The UK Government certainly didn't. Many other European governments didn't see this, um, this uh, redefining of, of, of the rules around borrowing or the further refinement of them subsequently. But it is the case, of course, we had a substantial um, non-NDP uh, um, programme of works and that, that, that work continues. One project that you've mentioned, uh, uh, or you've mentioned the fact that some projects have been reclassified, so the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, that means there's more pressure on the public sector borrowing. Um, 
but we're seeking to compensate for that by the fact that we're borrowing, if you like, to the maximum in relation to that. I think what's perhaps more worrying is that in relation to the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route and in relation to the M8 bundle, um, which is recently completed uh, or at le least recently opened, both of those were heavily invested in by the European Investment Bank. And the European Investment Bank has now said it will do no more business in the UK, even in advance of Brexit. I think that is uh, more of an issue for us. Of course, uh, we are currently examining the extent to which, uh, through the Scottish Futures Trust, we can continue to use NDP or what other methods might be available to us. And Jackie Billy will know about things like tax incremental financing and growth accelerator models to try and maximise investment and in infrastructure that we've undertaken as well. Um, but we will continue to uh, look at that. And despite all that's been said, um, and perhaps Mary McCallan can come back on the £234 million figure that you mentioned, despite all that's been said, we have got one of the biggest infrastructure programmes of any government in the devolution era, and that's across road, uh, rail and uh, housing as well. Could I ask you to repeat yes, the, the yes. particular issue around the 234? Okay. It was my understanding that as a consequence of the reclassification of particular projects, including the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary, um, that these were now on the public balance sheet um, and consequently for 1819, £234 million pounds of our £450 million ceiling on borrowing is having to be used for that purpose. Is that right? I'm really sorry, I can't answer that okay. question. I'll have to write to you. I don't think it has the effect. Uh, I'm happy to come back to, to Jackie Bailey in writing on that. We'll check with Derek Mackay. But it doesn't have that effect on the infrastructure. It means it's paid for in a different way. And it's not paid for in the way we'd like to pay for it. We prefer to pay for it through NDP rather than straightforward in the public uh, borrowing. But we still undertake uh, that activity. We'll still be having the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. No, I understand that. I'm, I'm just looking at the opportunity lost because we're having to borrow £234 million out of 1819 borrowing limits, um, which therefore can't be spent on other projects. That's the, the, the point I'm wanting to establish. Yeah, I, I, and that, I think that was the point I was making about the other ways in which we can use finance for infrastructure projects to maintain that building programme. Can I ask you very quickly about the National Investment Bank in the context of um, the what I call the Swinney rule on borrowing, where you have 5% um, is the limit for any repayments as a percentage of your discretionary budget for any borrowing items. Um, does the National Investment Bank count against that, that rule of borrowing? It, Mary's desperate to speak on this, but it would only <laughs> dep it would depend on the nature of the finance, um, financial transactions. Of course, the 5% rule, as you say, applies to the amount of borrowing that you have to repay in any given year. Uh, and we don't know the final, uh, as I mentioned in my response to Dean Lockhart previously, the final constitution or definition of the activities of the investment bank at this stage. But we'll know that very shortly, and I'm happy to come back at the point that we do know that. I'd expect it would be January or February. Convener and finally on fuel poverty um, the fuel poverty program it predominant predominantly um, through heats heaps budget line there's too many acronyms in this cabinet secretary um, but the Scottish government committed as I understand it to spending 0 0.5 billion over four years um, when they refresh their their target to end fuel poverty um, you'll appreciate that the actual spend is 114 million for 1718. Um, my understanding is that's the same as it moves forward. Um, that's short of the 125 million that that many of the organisations out there committed to tackling fuel poverty anticipate. Um, can we assume from that that the remaining years of the Parliament we will see much higher levels of funding, or is there scope to increase it now? That's the first part of the question. <laughs> I'll deal with one at a time, given okay. it's an area largely um, looked after by uh, Angela Constance rather than myself. But I think the total seat related budget for this year was £141.9 million, and that was made up of the 114 that Jackie Bailey mentions for fuel poverty and domestic energy efficiency, plus £27.8 million for non-domestic energy efficiency. Uh, and the draft budget, which Derek Mackay has announced, makes available uh, a further £144.1 million, so which I think I will have the effect of making sure that a half billion pounds uh, target is met, but uh, thankfully we have Chris Stark here who can give you even more detail on that. Um, that's entirely accurate. So um, the commitment was for half a billion for energy efficiency for four years, and we're well on track to make that commitment. 
Um, at the moment, we have separate schemes that deal with various aspects of energy efficiency. HEAPS is one of them. And um, I might agree that there are a lot of acronyms. There will shortly be fewer. So there will be a single, a single scheme, a single integrated scheme that looks at energy efficiency. And uh, the amount that we've allocated for 1819 towards those schemes um, that are relevant is 144.1. So we are, we are on track. Within that scheme, there are a number of things, including the HEAP scheme as it stands. We also look at various other ways of approaching energy efficiency. There are some non-domestic schemes. We also look at how we might decarbonize the heat system. Um, and all of those schemes are in some way focused on um, uh, reducing energy use and fuel poverty. My understanding of the 0 0.5 billion commitment was this was about residential properties rather than non-residential properties. So whilst you may be allocating 141 million, you'll forgive me if I focus on the residential properties and ask how much you're allocating for that. Um, uh, to confirm, I, I believe that the 0.5 million was for energy efficiency in the round, but I'm very happy to answer that question. Um, the, uh, for, for domestic properties, it's 114, but there are other schemes that, that are relevant in, that, in the domestic setting, so we would have to disaggregate those headings underneath that. So it is some th something higher than 114 is, is allocated, but the various schemes underneath it would need to be disaggregated in that way. And is it fair to say that the schemes underneath it, some of them will in fact be loans and will be targeting at those who perhaps don't experience fuel poverty, but there are issues of energy efficiency. So I'm, I'm keen to separate the two and look at fuel poverty for understandable reasons. Um, can you confirm within the 114 how much is granted and how much are loans, or are the loans the, these other separate schemes that you describe? Um, within the 114, it breaks down by, and then these are notional allocations at this stage, but our plan is that 72 of it would be capital, 12.3 would be resource, and 30 would be FTs, financial transactions or loans. Okay. Um, you'll appreciate the problem with loans is that they tend to be targeted at those who are perhaps not in fuel poverty um, and have a level of income that, that you would make them only eligible for a loan. By definition, that means it will take longer to deal with those who are the worst off in terms of fuel poverty um, by restricting the budget in that way. Has any you know, thought been given to actually removing the loans and making it the 114 at least, if not 125, grants rather than loans, if we're serious about tackling fuel poverty? Um, we've made a great deal of, um, we've done a great deal of analysis on how the program works, and I believe the 30 million is, is well targeted. I accept the point, though, that ca you know capital grants are um, more suitable for some uh, recipients than financial transactions. I think the scheme is well targeted, and it will be even better targeted when we, re when we sweep it up into a new scheme. I'm trying to remember, convener, but was it not the case that you underspent your loans last year? Yes, I think we did. I'm afraid oh, I don't okay. have. I don't know how much. I'm afraid. I might go and find out. Thank you, convener. Right. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much to the cabinet secretary and his team for coming in today to give evidence to the committee. Thank you. I'll suspend the meeting. We'll move into private session now.